Okay. <laughs> so, uh, this is my story, and, and I and I got to I got to talk to you a minute for why I, I started out with so. This is my story. I, I've got I've got four boys, and my youngest one he's 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 brilliant. He's one of those geek guys. He's, he, he will get his uh, PhD in biochemistry uh, next month. But every time he communicates to me, he, whether it's um, in person, uh, through email, or through text, starts every communication with, so. <laughs> <laughs> so are you still doing this? Are you still playing cards? And, and, just, and he's up at the University of Iowa. And um, uh, last month, I get an email from him. He says, so. I went out and started my car this morning, you know, it's like 10 below in Iowa, and I put it in gear and nothing happened. What should I do? <laughs> I'm, I'm 1,300 miles away, so I, I, I texted him back. I said, so, you ought to call a mechanic. <laughs> so, so my so start is in deference to my youngest son. Uh, I, I'm from Michigan, and, and I know there's at least two other people from Michigan. How many people are, are there? Who's from Michigan? Okay, there's, there's four of us from Michigan. And when you're from Michigan, and you're not from Detroit, people say, well, where are you? What do you do? What do you do, Terry? Do you know? You point. <clears throat> yeah, you, that's right. You, you hold your hand up and you point. I'm from here. <laughs> There's a map of Michigan. You know what they call people who are, who are from north of Port Huron? Where are they from? Over here? Thumb. They're from the Thumb. <laughs> so I, I'm, I was born in, on uh, Lake Michigan in Muskegon. And, and I hope Roy Brady is here, and he's also a, a Muskegon person. So I'm a West Michigan person. I, uh, and, and Muskegon uh, is, a, is a factory town. It, it, it is a, a traditional blue collar town. In fact, it, manufacturing is its lifeblood. And more specifically, foundry work is its lifeblood. And because of, uh, on, on, on the shores of Lake Michigan are a lot of, is a lot of dune sand, and the dune sand is perfect for, for sand casting. So uh, we're, we're a foundry town. But, but with a primary focus on, on automotive. So I, I grew up. I grew up on automotive. I grew up in a factory town. Um, lower middle class. In a lower, I was a lower middle class person, a lower middle class, very, very integrated neighborhood. I was the oldest of six kids. So you're taught responsibility at, at a very, very early age. Good Catholic family, by the way. <laughs> and, and, and the town was populated with a lot of people that came north during World War II to work in the factories to support the war effort. So we, we had a lot of folks from down south and even south of the US that, that came up to our area to work. So uh, it, it, was, it was a melting pot, a very integrated neighborhood. My, uh, my father was a, uh, a maintenance supervisor in one of those foundries. And, um, and for those of you that work in maintenance, and you know you, you, the time that you're the most active is when the plant is shut down. So um, if I wanted to bond with my father during holidays and vacations, I went to the factory with him. While he was working, I roamed around and, and watched. And I was always amazed at how things were made. And I thought, you know, that wouldn't be a bad career to work in, in, on, in manufacturing and how things were made. So that was my, my first exposure to manufacturing, and, and, and I loved it. But I always wanted to travel, too. Uh, I, you know, I would go to sleep at night with my transistor radio on, and occasionally I would get a skip, and I could get Chicago or, or St. Louis or some of those stations, and I always wondered what it would be like to go to Chicago or St. Louis or something far away. So I thought, well, you know, what's the best way to travel? And, and, and I thought, well, the best way to travel would be to, to drive a big rig. So my, my career goal was to, to, was to drive an 18-wheeler. And so I'm going through high school, uh, it was, uh, I, I thought that that was going to be my job. But what, I grew up in the, in the mid-60s. I was in high school during that time. 
and, and that was in the middle of Vietnam. And, and I had a, uh, my senior year, I had a friend come back in a body bag. And uh, I, I knew I didn't want to do that. And so I, when I, I talked to my counselor, and he said, well, there, there's this 4A deferment that you can get by going to college. And, and school always came easy to me in high school, but I really never thought much uh, about college. Um, but I applied. I applied to three schools. Uh, being a good Catholic boy, I applied to Notre Dame. I applied to Stanford because I, I had heard a lot of good things about that, and I applied to Michigan State. And uh, I was accepted in all three. Unfortunately, I didn't have any money, and neither did my family. So uh, going to uh, the, the state university was really the only option for me. So I went to Michigan State. And, um, and again, these were, these were turbulent times at, at Michigan State. For those of you that go back that far, and I know there's at least a couple of us that do, the mid to late uh, 60s, and you know, Martin Luther King was shot, and Bobby Kennedy was shot, and Kent State was going on. And, and there, was this, there was always this tension between leadership or management and the workers, or or the, uh, the establishment versus the non-establishment. And, and I, I, I struggled with understanding that. And so I vowed that I would not be the kind of leader who promoted the division between blue and white collar. I mean, I just, I, we're, we all put our trousers on one leg at a time. We're all human beings. And, and I felt it was best that, that people treat each other that way all the time. And so that, you know, that's kind of that part of my DNA uh, was the blue collar background, manufacturing, and exposure to a very turbulent time in a, in a liberal education system. But I love Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I got my first chance to travel my freshman year spring break. I came to Daytona Beach. My sophomore year, I came to Daytona Beach. <laughs> and there's only one thing that I didn't like about Daytona Beach. Either two, the, the two times, that's it, leaving at the end of the week. I hated to go home uh, for lots of reasons. The, 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 uh, I, I, I've always been on the water. I was born on the water. I, I love the ocean. Although, I, you know, after moving down here, it was three years before I stopped, started, stopped calling it a lake <laughs> and, and the ocean, because we had, we had the lakes there. So I, I, had, I had two years of experience in, in, the, in the late 60s of Daytona Beach, and, and always thought, gee, wouldn't it be nice to come back here? But then I, w I went back, uh, and I was the director of operations for a, a company in, in Michigan. Um, and, and they shut down in 1974, moved to Kentucky. So I had two options in 1974. My brother had just retired out of the Air Force after two tours, and he, he, had, a, he had a catamaran in Key West. And, and the company offered me a job in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. So I was, I was, I was weighing this. Kentucky, Key West, Florida. And I decided on Key West, Florida. So I, I retired uh, almost the entire year of 1975, went and lived on the, on the catamaran, uh, sailed to Cozumel back through the Windward Passage, had a great time in 75. But I realized one thing in living in Key West was that there was no good legal way of making a living. <laughs> And, and, and being a law-abiding citizen that I am, I, I, I came back uh, to Michigan, took a job as a, um, as a quality manager back in the college town, Lansing, that I, for a year. And then I got an opportunity to move back to the, the Lake Shore to GHSP and worked there for 28 years and, 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 um, and was also running facilities in Germany and, and, uh, and Japan at the time. And I got a call from our CEO one, uh, one day while I was over in Germany. He says, what do you think about Florida? <laughs> and I was thinking, yes. 
So I, I said I wanted to travel. And um, when I was at GHSP, and Jessica did a nice job of, of saying, uh, and I was there 28 years uh, as an employee, and now I'm just doing some consulting with them. I, uh, I, I did a lot of things there. I was, uh, I was a foreman, I was a superintendent, I was a quality control manager, I was vice president of engineering, I was a plant manager, vice president of sales and marketing, and then uh, I was an expat for two years uh, in, in uh, Germany, in our facility there. But also, I, I traveled to, to Asia. We were, um, we just started doing business with the Japanese and they were coming over to the US and so in 1994, 1995, I made 28 trips to Japan and back, twice in the same week once. Um, but the company also thought, also thought that this guy's gonna be doing all this travel and we're gonna open all these facilities around the world. He needs some more education. So uh, during that 94 and 96 time frame, I got my, my MBA in international business. Um, and, and then opened offices in, in Tokyo and Nagoya uh, to support the, the Japanese customers that we were doing business with. But it was, uh, so I, I did get to travel. Again, I got to travel a lot. Road to leadership. I, um, my leadership style or my leadership approach, I, we talked a I talked a little bit about the DNA that I had growing up in, in a blue collar collar town, uh, town being exposed to a, a liberal education during very turbulent times. But I also, I also had the opportunity to work with some fantastic thought leaders. Um, does, does anybody, if anyone that's in the quality profession would know who Dr. Deming is, um, back, in, back, in the, uh, back in the early 80s, and he was an old, older man at that time. I got the pleasure of working with him for a year. Um, that, uh, and, and, and Dr. Deming, for those of you who don't know him, I mean, he was a statistician by nature, and uh, statistics and numbers kind of come easy to me, uh, natural, so I, I, was, I was all about him, you know, I, you know the statement here, in God we trust, all others bring data. But Dr. Deming, Dr. Deming went over to uh, Japan after he was uh, dismissed by the, uh, the big three OEM and taught them uh, a new system on how to control projects and processes. And if you remember the Japanese back in the 50s and 60s, cheap cars, cheap transistor radios, then all of a sudden in the 70s and 80s, they're opening up plants in Georgetown, Kentucky, Marysville, Ohio, and they're eating our frickin' lunch with their quality and the delivery. And so the big three thought, well, maybe we ought to bring Deming back and see what this is all about. And, and they did. And, and the, thing about, the thing about Deming, I mean, he was, he was the father of data. Those of the, who were, were in quality understood statistical process control and all the things that he did. But he really was more about, about leadership. And his, his philosophy on leadership is to be consistent in what you do and give the people the tools they need to be successful, and then get the hell out of the way. So that, that was Demi. Eli Goldratt, uh, I didn't meet Eli, but I, was, I, was, I read his book, The Goal, back in, in the mid 80s, and it was the, that, that whole first thought process about 5S and lean manufacturing, uh, the theory of constraints, uh, drum buffer rope, uh, read the book, I won't go into any detail, but I became an advocate of it, I understood that. Jim Collins, Jim Collins is my hero. He wrote Good to Great. Uh, get the right people doing the right things and then decide where, to help, where, where it is you're going to go after you have the right people on the right seats on the bus. Jim Womack, I did get to work with. He co-wrote co a book called The Machine That Changed the World, the story of to the Toyota and the Toyota production system. I was able to collaborate with him on his second book on, on, uh, on lean manufacturing and get a little bit of a recognition in there. And then Peter Drucker. Uh, I, I, am a, I am a student of leadership and, and Drucker says that, that the tasks of leadership are to lead, to guide, to direct, to communicate, to measure, to motivate, and to develop people and processes. 
And uh, that certainly resonates with me. And in fact, we, we have a wiki out there on what leaders should be doing. And if anyone ever wants to look at that at some time, I'd be happy to, happy to share that. For, but I'm a real big fan of Drucker. So what does that all mean? I, I became, I think, a student of servant leadership. And that is give the people what they need and then get out of their way. There's nothing altruistic about that. Uh, it has nothing to do with ego. I, I think org charts are all upside down. The leader ought to be at the bottom of it. The customer ought to be at the top and, and then the employees. You know, there, there's people that, that, that in a leadership role say the buck stops here. I think the buck starts here at, at, at that leadership process. Uh, and org charts discount the importance of decision making. Um, I, I, and I read something, in fact it was just today from uh, Jack Welch, and I, for those of you who know Jack Welch, he's kind of the father of Black Belt and Six Sigma, but he was, he was a, somewhat of a tyrannical leader at GE. He says, before you're a leader, success is about growing yourself. After you become a leader, success is about growing others. I agree. So when I, when I got this opportunity to come back to Florida in 2004, uh, and Roy will remember this, I, you know, my mantra was stabilize, standardize, and then improve. And it was taking all that I learned from my mentors uh, in developing leaders and all that I had, had observed in the, in the uh, five or six presidents that I worked for. Oh, by the way, at GHSP, I, they finally told me why they gave me this job, is that we're still looking for something that you can do. <laughs> um, so this, this was my approach. It, it was, a, um, for those of you that had the pleasure of being in Hudson Tool and Die back in 2004, 2003, it was, um, it was a very dark and unsophisticated facility, uh, unengaged workforce. We had, we had absentee leadership. We were trying to run that business from up in Grand Haven, and we had a leader that, uh, after Paul Clare left, uh, for those of you that have been in VMA a while, you'd know Paul, uh, we brought somebody in that didn't work out for 18 months, and then they thought, well, maybe it's just best we don't provide leadership at all and let them, let, let them row aimlessly. And then they said, what do you think about Florida? So I, I, I came down, and, and, and my, my first week at Hudson Tool and Die, I, I'm sitting in my office, and I look out the window, and all of a sudden this Cadillac rolls up with two flags flying, the American flags flying, and this guy gets out of this, this plaid sports coat, and this little lady is walking behind him, and they're coming in here, and they said, we're the VMA, and we'd like to have you <laughs> become real <engaged. laughs> But I still like Florida. <laughs> so they said, we'd like to have you speak at, at, your, at our first next meeting. So I said, sure, I'll give you, I'll speak, and I'll give you my impressions of Hudson Technologies. And I remember it to this day, it was at the, the ATC. So I get up and talk about my observations of, of, of work and labor at, uh, at Hudson Technologies, and, and it, it was not a good thing. And, and so I make the comment is, well, if you can fog a mirror, you can get a job at Hudson. And, and of course, that, that made the paper. <laughs> Thank you, News Journal. Um, and the next morning, as I walk in the plant, there's about four people holding that out. But, but it was true, we had transient labor. Um, we, we brought them in, they would work for a couple, three weeks and, and then move on. Our wage structure wasn't where it needed to be. Uh, there was a lack of leadership. So we, uh, we, we tried to change that. Um, and then we went out and talked to our customers and there weren't that many glowing comments about what we were doing relative to quality and delivery. And of course my thing, coming being a, a VP of sales and marketing previously, I was out there asking for more business. 
And um, I think that's the last thing they wanted to hear. Then they would tell me, well, you're just a stamper. You're, you're, not, you're really not in our long range plan. So we, we had to make some changes. Uh, and, and, and some of those changes were personnel, getting the right people doing the right things, uh, getting into that standardization, being, being less of artisans and more of science, and, and to get, that, get the, the data out there on the floor, the standards out there on the floor. And then we, we ultimately changed our name to Hudson Technologies from Hudson Tool and Die, because we're really, we do have great tool and die makers. In fact, we've got a new apprenticeship program there, or Brett has a new apprenticeship program there. But, but we were a captive tool and die shop. We only did uh, work for ourselves and not for others. So we were getting those calls, can you make this or can you make that for us? And, and, and that's just not what we did. Um, so we changed our name to Hudson Technologies to reflect more of the direction that we wanted to go. Uh, stewardship. Our, our, our values um, at Hudson and our culture that we tried to develop were under four very basic concepts. It was about earning trust, and earning trust is doing what you say, say what you're doing, and uh, learn by doing, working together, and then stewarding the legacy. Leave the place better than what you found it whether it's your, on your job or at the end of your career. And so that was, that was always important to me. Um, we had four different cornerstones of that. And I want to talk a little bit about, about that. And, and I know uh, this is not to be about Hudson or the company, but it, but it, it truly is my philosophy as well. And, and the first one is, is around wellness. And, and, and thanks to uh, Wendy and her team, I heard her talk maybe eight, seven or eight years ago about this uh, workforce wellness, and, and, I, and I bought into it. And uh, we started down that, that road of, of wanting people to get, to get healthy. And, and, and there was, and, and certainly, you know, in the long term, there's a cost benefit for that. But for me, it really had to do with uh, making sure that that workforce had self-esteem. If you feel good about yourself, you're much more likely to feel good about your work and your job. And that whole concept of presenteeism was important to me. But that being said, and we, we now six or seven years into go, we, we've done a very good job of, of cost containment and lots of success stories out there in the workforce, Roy. Is, is one of those that lost a, a ton of weight, quit smoking, and now he's a runner, and, and there's, there's just more and more people that are, that are doing that. So that, that was important to me. Uh, going green was important. We were, uh, the process that we had in, in, uh, at Hudson Technologies was using a solvent degreaser, trichloroethylene, uh, to clean our parts. Um, trichloroethylene was, absolutely the best thing in, in the industry. And, it, and we've been using it since 1940 to, to clean product. And you know, a, a, about in the 70s or so, the EPA came along and decided that, mm, it's not the best thing to, to be doing. But you know, we had a very good closed loop system, but we had people, we had, we had to monitor people, we had to send people out for blood tests, just to make sure that our levels of trichloroethylene weren't above any, any of the standards that were required. And, and, and we were doing that. But the right thing to do for people was to, was to eliminate it altogether. And so we, we embarked on this two-year journey, and we spent over $2 million. And, and the thing with, with a cleaning system, if, you, if those of you who are in industries like us, you, you, you don't go part way. You're either there or you're not. So we, and this picture is the ceremony where we, we shut off our um, uh, solid degreaser system at the end of uh, December 2007? 2007, yeah, it's seven years ago now. Um, and, uh, but but the, I, the, there was a residual benefit that, uh, that I saw from the process. Because when we started down this path, tools didn't work commitments were missed, uh, was it the lubricant's fault, was it the tool's fault, 
was it the scheduler's fault? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You know, we were we had customers that that demanded product, and and we needed to uh, to deliver on that. So the, you know, the barriers came down. You know, the, the, this whole idea of siloed management. Well, engineering does this, and manufacturing does this, and tool room does this. That stuff doesn't work. We had to work together to make it happen. So that whole re, uh, residual benefit of, of going green really was one of those kind of defining moments, I think, in the, in the in the Hudson Technologies, at least during my my time there. And, and you know, probably one of the things that I'm most proud of is that that we we got rid of that stuff, and, and now we generate zero hazardous waste at Hudson from our manufacturing process from from being one of the largest generators in, in the county prior to that. So, um, and the other thing it was is that it, the, the other thing is the next is leadership development. And you know, I talked a little bit about the wiki that that uh, that I'm I'm working with others on on you know how, what do you need to do to develop leaders? And and it really is it really is around those Drucker principles of lead, organize, direct, communicate, measure, motivate, and develop people's and people and processes. And so I I have been spending a lot of my time doing that and a lot of my time towards the end of my career, particularly as I was grooming my successor uh, to, to Hudson Technologies, is working on those concepts within our group. And, but that's what leaders do. And I, let me, I'll, just, I'll just segue away for a second. The, the difference between leadership and management, and, and I, you know, if you want to get the hair going on the back of my neck is, is to call me a manager. Managers manage processes. Leaders develop people. Big difference. So in, in your own organizations, make sure that you, you know that distinction, you live that distinction, that are, are you a leader or are you a manager? And maybe there's times that you, you do have to manage, but it, you know, what got you here isn't gonna, isn't gonna be what gets you there. So the leadership is very different. And, and the last thing, and, and the thing that I really spent a lot of time, and, and Jessica mentioned that, that I'm uh, chief strategy officer, that's a big title, but um, it gets me, it got me into the door with Chrysler and Ford at a relatively high level, if I had a title like that, was developing strategy and, and strategic planning. And um, there is an approach that, that I've taken, and it's based on a book by a guy named Vern Harnish, that's, uh, and it resonated with me, and it's called Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. But it takes a lot of, this, a lot of the principles that, that Drucker talks about, a lot of the principles that Collins, there's a lot of Collins in here, by the way, uh, and, and it forces companies, or if it's done right, to, first of all, you need the right people doing the right things to, to develop that strategy, to develop that big, hairy, audacious goal, that's a Collins term, um, and then put plans in place to make sure that there's execution on the strategy. Working on strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats. Uh, looking, looking for creative adaption or creative destruction of that opportunity and threats. Um, I've always said to my team, I want to obsolete myself before somebody else does that. So you look for, you look for those opportunities, but, but, the, the, the elegance behind this, if it's done correctly, is the communication that takes place afterwards. So, and, and, it, and, it, and it, there's a rhythm that happens every day, every week, every month, talking about uh, key initiatives, key thrusts, 90-day action plans, individual rocks, uh, all terms that people who really get into this understand but there's so many people, so many companies, that go off-site and develop strategy, and they, they come up with this big, thick book, and then, and then they go back, and it's the tyranny of the moment. You know, let's get, go back and do our job, and, and strategy becomes uh, a thing that sits on the, on the desk until we do it again next year. Gee, that, wouldn't that have been nice to do that? Um, you know, it, it even works uh, for nonprofits. We, uh, the VMA has a strategy. We have our BHAG to be the preeminent manufacturer in the state of Florida, and I can tell you that we're very close to being there. Uh, our, our, three, our three pillars or our three 
key thrusts, and all of our, all of our board members know that, are around uh, education growth and relevance, and everybody who's on our board is working on at least one of those things. And if you're not working on that, you're working on the wrong stuff. I'm, uh, you know, the, the articles in the paper today uh, kind of dismayed me a little bit. I, I'm also working uh, with the United Way on their strategy to be a, to a, for a community impact model instead of a community chest on uh, health, income, and education, very much, very similar to uh, the VMA. And our, our, our primary key thrust is on the health of, of, of Volusia and Flagler County. And now we have, we have a baseline based on what we saw in the paper today, where we are from a health perspective is not in a good place. And I, uh, I intend to pour a lot of my future en energy in helping this community become healthier. Well, one, because it's passionate, it's a passion of mine. And, and again, as I said before, it's the right thing to be working on. Uh, but work-life balance, and I talked a little bit about traveling. I just wanted to share a couple of my travel photos with you. My first one said, that's at the Great Wall in China. And if you've ever gone to the, the, the Great Wall gate outside of Beijing, there's, there, there's this climb that, I mean, you, you, you're up into the clouds. And, and, but I was determined that I was going to go up there and I was going to make this climb. And it took about two and a half hours. Um, I don't know whether four or five miles or whatever it was, but it was steep, the climb. So I, I get to the top. And so I, I, I'm in this victory pose, and you know, one, of the, one of the Chinese guys was, was with me, snapped my picture when I was there. And then I looked down alongside me, and there's two 80-year-old Chinese women eating their lunch. <laughs> and, and, and I wonder what the big deal is, you know? Um, the next picture is that, you know, that now I, am, I am spending time working with the Manufacturers Association of Florida and with the, our federal organization, uh, the National Association of Manufacturing, lobbying on behalf of, of uh, manufacturing. And every chance I get, uh, Jane and I meet with uh, the guy that's the, currently our governor. And uh, we, we pushed across an agenda last year that gave tax breaks on capital equipment. And uh, you know, one of the things that's passionate to me that I'm working on is to get a research and engineering tax credit for, for manufacturers. And hopefully it doesn't take the, the 20 years that the other one took, and I, we're able to realize that. But as I mentioned, I, I am a sports fan, and uh, go green. <laughs> that uh, if everything works out, the Florida wins tonight and Saturday, and Michigan State wins Friday and Sunday, they will be meeting next Saturday for the semifinals. Now, the last time they met at this level was for the 2000 uh, national championship, and the green team won. <laughs> but, but that, but, but Florida's won a couple of years since then. They've, they, they've got, they, they gotten their, their time back. So, I, I ho hopefully, we get to that next Saturday, and then it'll be a great game. Uh, and the last picture, uh, we do a lot of business now with the Chinese. And, uh, and, 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 and let me talk a little bit about that. We, we, have, we have three facilities in China. We have one in Mexico. We have uh, uh, offices in, in uh, Germany now. But we don't go there for the labor. We don't go, we, I don't believe in, in that, that whole concept of, of cheap labor. We go where the market is. And these are all of our automotive businesses. And as you know, they're building cars over in China now. So we're, we're supporting the Chinese auto market from China. Uh, we're, we're, they're building cars in Mexico, Nissan, Honda, Chrysler, all have facilities, Volkswagen in Mexico. And we're supporting them from Mexico. And we're trying to break it back into the European auto market with the sales and marketing effort that we have there. And uh, also uh, Thailand. Uh, we're, are going to be hotbeds for, for production. So this is not about offshoring. This is not about reshoring. It's about rightshoring for us. And so um, you know, some people bristle when, they, when they, uh, they hear that we have facilities in China. But they're, from my perspective, they're there for the right reason. So 
business is a team sport. And, and the reason why I have this up here, uh, in, in, my, in my free time now, I've, uh, I've joined the Halifax Rowing Association. And uh, I am no longer a leader. <laughs> I'm one of these guys that sits in the back. And there's a coxswain up there who's leading, who's directing, who's uh, organizing, who's communicating, who's measuring, and who's motivating me and trying to develop me as a, as a rower. And by God, I'm going to learn. <laughs> so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Is there any questions on this? Does any of this make sense? Yeah. 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 You talked about the concept of give them what they need and then get out of the way. Yeah. Do you, do you have a gray area where they feel he doesn't care what I'm doing? Um, there, 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 there's a difference between abdicating responsibility and allowing uh, people to be responsible, decision be making being at the appropriate level. Now, the, the, the other, there's, there's parts of that, and that's measuring and motivating and developing. And so measuring is important. If you, if you, this is not about abdicating responsibility. It, it's about having responsibility at the appropriate level. So it, uh, it, it is, you know, it, I, I think many CEOs, CEOs think that they've got to be the smartest guy in the, the organization. I never felt that way. But first of all, I knew it wasn't true. And, and secondly, uh, I, I respect people that, I mean, if I, if I didn't think someone was a good person for the job, I, I wanted to do something about it. We, we always had a, uh, a uh, mantra at, at Hudson, hire tough and fire easy. And, but it had to do with you making sure that you had the right people doing the right things at the right time. And um, so they, it wasn't abdication at all. Yeah. The, uh, no. the principles that you have um, will operate a little differently depending upon the size of the organization. Well, it was, it was certainly in smaller organizations, you need to do uh, a lot more and a lot different. You're the HR manager, you're the CEO, uh, you're, you're, you're the salesperson, you, you, have, a, you have a lot of uh, other responsibilities too, but you still have people working for you, and um, and you. I still think you need to allow them, you train them, and then allow them to do their job. And and you know, at, within you know the great game of business, uh, which is another thing I didn't really talk about, but I truly believe in. Keeping score is important. You know, people want to be part of a winning organization. So they got to know what winning means. How, you know, how do you keep score? I've, uh, I, 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 I'm, I wear this thing, if I can get it out of my pocket, it's called Fitbit, where I monitor how many steps I take every day, how many calories I burn, how many, how many uh, stairs I climb, how many hours of sleep that I, that I get, and it's because I like to measure. I, 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 <laughs> So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not competing with anyone else. I'm competing with life. And, and, I, uh, and, and, and I want to keep going. So I, I do everything that I can. And, and the way that I make it resonate for me is by keeping score. Mark, can you talk for just a moment or two about your philosophy on where ethics and business is right now and your beliefs about it? Uh, um, you know, ethics is a, ethics a, a, as, you, as you mean are doing things illegally, immoral, or, uh, or is it value and culture? Um, you know, certainly, certainly ethics are extremely important to any organization. And, uh, and I absolutely think unethical people should be held accountable. But I mean, I don't know. How do you reinforce strong, good business ethics in a larger company? Um, 
Another concept that I, that I had that I really didn't talk about is that I, I truly believe that people that worked with me were my business partners. And, and, and I respected them as, as business partners. But if, if the, there, there were some non-negotiables that we had, and, and it was just a baseline uh, of non-negotiables. And if, if, you, if you cross that line, you, you were gone. Two questions. First, how's Florida? How's Florida? <laughs> I ain't going back. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm not working down here now, and I'm still here. <laughs> well, I moved up here in the 1980s, and I've been dealing with Hudson Tour and I and home like my factory. Yeah. 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 And they were both, both good organizations. Yeah. But however, home like faded away, and you guys keep going, growing, and getting better. What specifically we did since 1980 to make it better? Well, eight, I mean, certainly 80. My corporation didn't buy Hudson until 1984. Yeah. Uh, Hudson was owned by the uh, uh, the Fitzpatrick family before that, and we bought we bought Hudson in '84, and uh, and moved some of the. And we were in New Jersey and in Florida, and we ultimately. Uh, Moved, shut down New Jersey and moved everything to Florida in '91. So my, my my history with 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 Hudson doesn't go back quite that far. Nor uh, Kate and, and Roy are here from from Hudson. Nor nor do theirs. So I, I really can't comment much about. Uh, certainly, a, as an owner and uh, as a JSJ stockholder, I I followed them, but I couldn't comment on on. On the details of the company prior to 2004, but I, but I, but I will tell you, and it goes back to that ethical question: whether you're a supplier of ours, whether you're a customer of ours, or whether you're a member of the, the community, we, we, I, I, I do believe in that that respect, that uh, in that whole extended enterprise that you treat customers, employees, uh, the community, your suppliers, and your owners with the same, the same respect. I was supplier, I was told they cannot bear it up here. Oh. I saw it in the I used to be supplier for a long time. Mm -hmm. To you, to all my Thompson Farm, to the Shell, yep. Microflex. I still have a lot of connection around the city. But I always like the company. Yep, no, thank you. Any, yeah, Mike? All right, so other than getting to Florida, yeah. what, uh, <laughs> tell us about one of the more challenging, what, what was the most difficult thing that you um, culture, culture changing, that, that that sea change that I thought that needed to, to take place. You don't you don't put platitudes up on the wall. You don't you know you can you can you can say what your values are, what your culture is, and put them up on on whatever format that you want. But walk out on the plant floor and find out is that really the kind of company that you have, and so. Um, you know, listening to the voice of the customer is one thing, but listening to the voice of the of the employees was another. And uh, you know, the opening comment was, you know, from from shop floor to boardroom. I am much much more comfortable on the shop floor than I am. I've learned a, a little about being in the boardroom, and I I can do that. But I spent a lot of my time talking to the people and finding out what the culture really was like. And, and what we had to do to, to, to put it in the direction that we thought was appropriate. So that was the biggest challenge. In, in, in leadership, I, I think when you look at leadership, there's three phases that you have. You know, the, the first phase is the observation. You, you come into a company, and I, I, how long have you been with, uh, what, three years, two years? 16 months. 16 months. So you're probably still in that observation uh, stage. And, and then the, the second stage, phase is to kind of implement your strategy. And, and then the next phase is to tweak that strategy and, uh, and to grow from that. And I would tell you, every year, we got year-over-year -year improvement in, in profit, return on investment, with the exception of 2009. We took a little bit of a dip like everyone else, but year-over-year -year, uh, uh, improved returns and for both for the people in their bonus structure and for the owners in, in their in their equity stake. 
Uh, but, but I think at the end of the time is to know when it's time and to let someone else do that. Uh, so, you know, some people say it's a six year span. Some people say it was a nine year span. For me, it was closer to 10. I, I'm a little slow on the take. But, it, but, it, uh, but you, should, you should know when it's time as well. But, I, you know, for me, that, 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 that first phase, that, that observation phase, and then trying to turn that ship around um, was, was the tough part. Right people in the that's right, that's right. And, and that, took, that took time. And, and I would tell you there, you know, there's some things I could, I should have done quicker. Some things I, maybe the trigger was a little too quick, but, um, you know, with one exception in, in our leadership, there wasn't any, when I left, there wasn't anybody doing the same thing other than one person doing the same thing that they were doing when, when I got there. Yeah, Alan? How do you get the employees to really understand what the customer's perspective is on the service that you're providing to them? To, I mean, to really understand how important their jobs are relative to the product that you're producing and have them know that the customers have very little tolerance well, for screw-ups. Well, you know, for me, it's measuring the right things, and, and whether that's a customer scorecard or however, however, the, however your customer judges you, that ought to become front page news in, in every communication that you have with, with employees at every level. Because when you look at that servant, that servant leadership model, you know, the closest thing to the customer is the person that's making the product. And if, if they don't know what the expectations are, and secondly, if they're not being held accountable to those expectations, then, 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 the, then the people below them aren't doing their job right. For example, if you have a quality return situation, yeah, yeah. That, that you can then bring those employees in specifically that are all involved in that process and say, this is what has happened in the field, this is the repercussion yeah. of what you're producing. You know, I, I, I would take a little bit different approach and, you know, what, you know, what systematically broke down so that that happened? You know, did we not train properly? Did we not have uh, the systems in place to, to make sure that that quality didn't get out? But certainly the education is important. Were you ever a machinist or a Yeah, yeah. Um, after I got my uh, bachelor's degree, I, uh, and I was working with tool and die makers a lot, and, uh, and in order not to be buffaloed, I, I went back and took two years of machining. So I could, I could run a mill, a lathe. Now the old way, this is back in the, remember this is back in the 70s. This was, this was before CNC and any of that stuff. But, I, but I, could, I could put something in a chuck and I could, I could put a thread on it, I can tell you that, yeah. Not much more than that, but... I, sometimes managers get lost in managing and doesn't quite know what the Indians are doing. Yeah, well, well leaders should know. But, but, it, but it doesn't mean that you have to know everyone's job. It is that you, you, you have the right people doing that. And, and I, uh, I mean, the last, last place you want me is in the tool and die room. <laughs> I mean, I, and, and they know that. Very good. Thank you. I think I'm done.